nice, lovely little letters from my insurance company. And now I have a nice, shiny new roof, which uh, I had to pay for. But uh, before we get started on this, um, our sponsor this year is the, or not our sponsor, but our, <laughs> our charity, our designated charity, is the uh, Arthritis Foundation. We are collecting on behalf of the Arthritis Foundation. So if you have uh, some spare change or a dollar or two that you could kick in, we would appreciate it. I'm going to go around uh, around the room here uh, with the collection bucket, and we can get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rich Gatz. I'll be the moderator for today. Um, a brief background on me. What we'll do is we'll do some intros, um, and then I'll I'll kind of do a, a, a brief overview before um, asking some questions of our panel. Um, the way that I typically like to do panels here is if you have a question, come up and ask it while you're actually thinking of it. Um, we're not going to wait until the end to do any Q&A, just because I think it's nice to talk about things contemporaneously with the greater discussion. Um, and yeah, we'll just get going. So Rich Gatz, I'm the head of cyber claims at Arch Insurance. Um, I'm a lawyer by trade, but got into insurance because I hated billing. Um, hours, which if anyone here has ever done that, it's terrible, um, and started my career doing professional liability insurance. So directors and officers, um, lawyers, medical malpractice claims, things like that. Um, up until 2013, when I was the only person in a room full of insurance executives that knew what a Bitcoin was. And at that point, they said, oh, you must know what you're talking about. So you're now our technology subject matter expert. So you'll be helping us with cyber and other types of insurance. And I said, what cyber insurance? I'd never heard of it before. So anyways, that's my background. Um, I'll turn it over right to the left and we'll just go down the line. My name is John Padfield. I am a business professor and I teach graduate courses in data analytics. I'm also a former Indiana state representative and been a privacy advocate for a long time. I helped draft and pass the law that Indiana has about uh, use of cameras and uh, uh, acquiring consent before uh, getting, before using cameras. Uh, anyway, look forward to the discussion here today. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Matthew Griglia. I'm a historian, author, activist, um, and a senior policy analyst at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is a nonprofit civil liberties group focusing on technology policy out of San Francisco. Um, I have to admit, uh, I don't know very much about insurance at all. Uh, I'm a, a last minute substitution on this panel, but my expertise is in uh, police and government surveillance. So. Uh, where I can be of use on this panel is uh, just about any technology that can invade your your privacy. I um, have studied it quite comprehensively and hopefully can contribute uh, some to this conversation. Hi, apologize I'm late. There was a little bit of traffic since my last panel. Um, I'm Jim Nettles. So for purposes of this panel, we'll skip over the being a sci-fi writer and some of that good stuff. Um, I'm also a nonfiction writer. I spent a lot of time talking about privacy, data security, business, entrepreneurship. Um, but in relevance to this panel, um, my main life is in business and technology consulting. 35 years in and around financial services, um, banking, investments, blockchain, and insurance. Uh, I've spent much of my career uh, designing, building, working with insurance companies, designing products like cyber. Um, in fact, I'm in a product. Uh, product project right now designing cyber with uh, Lloyd's London. Um, I have been in risk management and so I'm very much in both the technology aspects of it, uh, but I'm also a consultant in the industry. So I'll be here to probably cause some trouble and be on both sides of the argument. So depending on which me is answering the question as to which one of me is getting into trouble. Awesome. Thank you. So I think we need to start with kind of laying the foundation of what is insurance, right? Like everyone kind of money laundering. Yeah. Well, I mean, some, some people say it's a Ponzi scheme, right? Like you, if you think about insurance, you take in premium to pay other people's claims, right? Now, what happens if you don't take in enough premium, you can't, you know, necessarily pay the claims. Now there are some additional regulations. Like generally when you have an insurance policy, let's say you have a $1 million, we'll say homeowner's insurance policy. 
that means that that insurance company, if it is a, a good one uh, or even an okay one, they take that million dollars and they put it somewhere, right? This means that an insurance company in order to be properly capitalized has to have the corpus of every policy that they write. They have to have those funds readily available. Now, what a lot of people don't know is insurance companies, because of that requirement, are some of the largest investors in the world because they take that whole, like the, the capitalized policies that they have and they invest them, okay? And they put them in very conservative, short-term or long-term kind of securities and every bit of interest they get goes towards their bottom line, right? So, but generally insurance has always been kind of a risk mitigation tool. It really kind of started at Lloyd's of London where they began to insure uh, ships that were sailing across the ocean during, you know, the East India, you know, uh, heyday. And um, as time went on and, and insurance kind of grew, it kind of became part of almost every aspect of our lives, right? You have property insurance, car insurance, healthcare insurance, numerous times of business insurance. You basically get insurance for almost anything these days. Um, if any of you are college football fans, a lot of college football players before the draft will actually insure themselves in case they get injured. Um, I think there was a famous case of Celine Dion actually insuring her vocal cords via the Lloyds of London. So you basically have this, this tool where you have the ability to mitigate your risk should something happen when you have something that's insured. Okay. And so an insurance company wants to only insure specific things depending upon what they're trying to protect. All right. And so in the insurance space, the way that they might call this on the policy level, like a covered peril, right? For homeowners insurance, wind, hail, earthquake potentially, right? Those are covered perils. Cyber insurance, network security incident, data privacy violation, right? And so when you're thinking about things from the insurance context, I want you to understand that insurance isn't meant to cover everything. It is only meant to cover what is in the contract of insurance. An insurance policy is a contractual document between the insurer and the insured. All right. It is not, I mean, as you guys can probably expect, insurance companies aren't doing this out of the goodness of their heart. They're doing this to make money. Okay. And this is important because when you're discussing kind of the general premise of, of this panel of, you know, how do you underwrite risk? How do you aggregate premium while underwriting risk? You need to know that they're trying to cover certain things and they're trying to not only estimate what their losses are going to be, but try to forecast what their losses might be in the future. All right. And because the, the less losses you have, as you can expect, the more profitable an insurance company is. Now, the one thing I will say is that the primary benefit of insurance companies is paying claims, okay? And so having worked in the insurance industry for almost 16, 17 years now, I pay a lot of claims, right? And so without the payment of claims, insurance companies, they're the raison d'etre, it like just goes away, okay? But that being said, you know, again, the premise of this panel is is the underwriting process in different genres of insurance too robust? Are they aggregating too much data? Are they using tools that maybe they shouldn't to potentially risk the insurance being placed with individuals or companies who might otherwise have been able to get that insurance policy, but for the additional data that's being aggregated in regards to their, their risk profile? So with that, the first question I wanted to ask of, of the panel and whoever wants to take this feel free is, is more data better, right? Like in our technological world, it seems we're just getting, you know, hit over the head with data, 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 right? From an insurance perspective and from a, a policyholder perspective, do we think data is better? And so the way I want to ask this is from like the insurance carrier side, which maybe I'll take unless you guys want to, and then also from the policyholder side. So why don't we start with the policyholder side first? Um, so from a policyholder side, the answer is some data, some additional data is better. The problem is you do not know how much is already collected and aggregated, which is literally everything. Um, building data feeds, things like that, the amount of information that insurers carry, bring in, and are able to access and then tie to your premiums, your rates, all of that is 
significantly more than you can imagine. And really, at this point, the only data they don't have access to is the stuff that doesn't entirely exist yet. Um, if you look back about, if I go back when I first started, you could get tons of data. We just didn't have the processing capability to do anything with it. Um, now, big data and the ability to use AI to go crunch that and actually do personalization on it. The number of products, it's not that do they need more data, it's literally almost a matter of what do they not have. Um, and so if you have, uh, if you've submitted, you know, to 23andMe or any of these sorts of things, yeah, you know, you've given up that data, you've given up that rights, pretty much everything you have and everything you do is being sold every day. Let, me, let me ask you a quick question, here. like a specific instance. So a lot of car mm -hmm. insurance companies will give you this thing that you can plug in that monitors mm -hmm. your driving. Mm -hmm. All right. So it's collecting data on how fast you're driving, how fast you, how hard you break, things like that. Does that specific tool benefit the policyholder? It can. Um, I've, I've built some of the integrations and stuff to pull that kind of data. Um, but here's part of what's coming is that's going to, they're go, it's going from being something that's incentivized to something that's been discussed in legislation to make mandatory. And so it'll go away from being those devices to being just a data feed from your car. Um, and so the amount of data that's already available from most vehicles made in the last, I'm, I'm going to genuinely, or generally call five years, but the amount of data and feeds and things that are available, the amount that is tracked in your vehicle, specifically the amount of data that's logged, cameras everywhere that you don't know are there, you get in an accident, the amount of stuff that feeds in on that accident takes away a lot of the debate over the years about what happened because they have a picture of you looking at your cell phone. They have the picture of, of knowing how much you were playing with that cell phone because they'll have the last 30 seconds of video of what you were doing when that accident happened or whatever else may have happened. So can it be beneficial? The answer is yes, because that data shows how you were driving, how you were behaving. The other vehicle, you know, hypothetically, you get how they were driving, how they were behaving. And at some point, it will be both vehicles recorded everything leading up to that incident. Yeah, I mean, I think I think data is itself. This is something that's been said several times in this room in the last few days. Data itself is is neutral. Um, you know, it's about how you use that data and and what it represents. So, you know, one could. If one like lived a, a healthy lifestyle, one would think that you would want necessarily more data collected because it might lower your insurance rates. Um, the problem is uh, when that data is maybe incomplete. So for instance, a scenario in which your GPS records you going every day to a donut shop. Um, and it could be that you get a green tea there or you walk your dog because your dog likes to pee outside this donut shop. But what they see is you go to a donut shop every day. So you might not be eating healthy, so your insurance rates go up. So that is a place where like actually more data might help you um, versus less. The problem is the more data they collect, the more ultimately vulnerable you are because the more data they have sitting on their servers, the more they could do with to, to charge you more for insurance or the more vulnerable that data is to selling it to other companies, to data breaches where bad actors might get a hold of and a ton of incredibly sensitive data. Um, so I, I think there are scenarios in which you would imagine more data collected about you could actually help lower your insurance rates, but uh, it depends on what the the snapshot of your life they get from that data, how much they have, how long they hold on to it, and and what they do with it, how they store it, how secure it. Yeah, and I, I think it's important to, like when we discuss insurance, and especially in the payouts of claims, um, how many here have heard of a, a bad faith claim? Okay, awesome. So essentially an insurance company in all 50 states has an obligation and legal duty to deal with their policyholders in good faith okay what that that's a bunch of legalese that basically says they need to act reasonably in regards to coverage and the payment of claims all right and there is an incredible amount of case law precedent um, and plaintiff's attorneys who will, are very happy to uh, sue insurance carriers for bad faith. And the reason this is important is because if an insurance carrier is sued for bad faith, they are potentially liable for extra contractual damages. 
What this means is, let's say you get into a car accident, you have a $25,000 policy. Car, a car insurance company A says, you know what, we're not paying this. And you're like, no, I got in a car accident. I timely reported it and this is covered under my policy. And they go, no, we're not paying it. You end up suing them. That insurance company is now on the hook for all of your damages, including that in excess of the $25,000 policy limit. So there is a huge rationale, a huge reason for insurance companies to actually deal in good faith with their policyholders. Again, my tent is I work for the man slash woman in insurance. Okay. I been deposed in bad faith litigation okay so they're really I, I really do want you all to know that generally insurance companies they will do what's in their policy now does data benefit insurance carriers i would say yes and that's probably the obvious answer but in some ways i think it also benefits policyholders in that if an insurance carrier can underwrite better risk then they will keep their premiums low because what happens is, is there's a market dynamic in place in the writing of insurance and insurance speak, we call it either a soft market or a hard market. A soft market is where premium is going down, claim activity is going down, coverage is increasing. A hard market is premiums going up because of an increased claim activity. The prototypical example of this is COVID when the ransomware epidemic went crazy and all these network security claims started happening in large scale breaches. So cyber insurance right now, uh, or at that point got very expensive with premiums tripling anywhere from like a hundred to 200 percent right but since covid kind of died down ukrainian conflict happened and all the you know eastern european threat actors started fighting each other it then became a soft market and we saw a massive decrease in premium so in a certain extent if the market pressures hold true better data means better better underwriting which means less losses which means that you can insure more people for cheaper Okay. Can I add just one kind of use case that we're actually seeing much more of now that may give a little context? Um, so think about your homeowner's insurance. Right now, so much stuff is built on zones and wide scale spacing of places. Uh, think about floodplains. You know, right now, flooding, beaches, even inland, you know, 100 year floods are having happening every six months, sometimes in the same place. I'll take Charleston a couple of weeks ago where I had a friend's house flood again for the third time in 10 years um, on part of it. So some of the things that are being looked at traditionally, it would be if you're trying to gauge where something is in, in the floodplain, um, a generally it's a, yeah, we're just going to go say that this block of acreage is a floodplain period where we're good to go. And it's going to be priced and rating accordingly, or they're going to go and say, oh, no, 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 this spot that's over here is on average three feet higher and is not in the floodplain anymore. Well, now what they can do is actually load the levels of topo data to be able to see not only about your particular piece of property, but what else can be impacted by floodplains to maybe say your house is sitting on a hill 15 feet up because you did it or you put it in stilts or whatever you may have done. So your house is much, much less likely to flood unless, of course, a hurricane comes through in Charles. But on the other hand, the house that is technically not in the floodplain but is sitting in a dip, they come and say, well, you actually are much higher. And now we're seeing this come through where insurers are less likely to then approve insurance for a house being built in those planes. So this is a place that the, that the, that the policy benefits the insured or the potential insured by sometimes preventing damage and preventing a buyer from doing something that would not work out for them. You know, uh, the, oh, you wanna buy that house on that barrier island? Well, we can tell you in five years that house is not gonna be there, so we wouldn't recommend you buying it. Or here's gonna be your policy premiums. The amount of information you can be given is trem tremendously more beneficial. The downside of it is they're also much more able to target premiums to, by the way, yeah, your house, sits a foot lower than the rest of the neighborhood if you're in a swimming pool that could be a problem i wanted to point out that data has always been used in insurance what i what i see is the nature of the data is shifting in the past if we just look at something like auto insurance get a speeding ticket that's data get a speeding ticket your rates are going to go up be involved in an accident that's data your insurance rates are going to go up 
but now the shift is going from this has happened, your rates are going up to this could happen, your rates are going up. Yeah. With uh, predictive and the, the, behavior. The, the comment about the uh, the insurance devices, uh, Matt and I were on a panel in this room yesterday talking about uh, the challenge of opting out of telematics. Right now, the state of Texas is suing General Motors for sharing that stream of data for the past 10 years. The, the lawsuit, it's a 36-page lawsuit against GM. Um, Attorney General Ken Paxton said that it started in 2015 and that GM has been selling data without the consent of the customers for that long a time. So in my mind, I, I see a very sharp distinction between I volunteer to work with my insurance company, get a device to plug into the OBD port on my car and share that information with the insurance company versus without my consent, General Motors decides to sell my data to an insurance company. General Motors side is well, you can send it to that and customers are saying, I know nothing about it because uh, according to the lawsuit, dealerships were trained on how to railroad people into agreeing to this. And uh, some of the salespeople were assisting people in, uh, in agreeing to this. I think another important point is just that there's, obviously there's so much data being collected on you all the time and almost all of it can be used to infer something about your health. And so with all of that being up for grabs, the idea that, you know, um, I mean, I've seen cases where police try to get access to people's, um, the, the electric use in their house to know whether they're home or not. And, and there's a, a big demand for this data about how much electricity your home is using to, in part to just figure out whether you're home or not. Um, and so just thinking about like, you know, what insurance could infer about you and your healthy lifestyle if your lights are on all night long. Um, or uh, how many steps your phone records you taking because we know like, you know, recording uh, how many steps you take in a day is something like we know insurance companies give out Fitbits to people for this exact purpose. Smart fridges records, you know, so I've seen some of that record what is in your fridge at any given time, like your eating habits linked to your credit card, what, where you're buying food from, what you're buying at the grocery store. Like all of this is data that is collected that the, the insurance industry can get their hands on if they have it already. I, I would, yeah. I would probably, you know, respectfully disagree and, and just a little bit in that um, insurance companies have to ask for your consent to get data, right? Like I understand insurance companies bad, I get that. But, you know, yes, a ton of data is being collected, but from a carrier perspective, you generally need a lot of consent for it in the personal context, okay? Like for health insurance, you, you know, if you're sharing health data, like you have HIPAA, right? You have a lot of data privacy protections at both the state and federal level to, to make sure that people aren't just sharing your stuff willy nilly. And then hence the, the Texas action, you know? So yes, there's a ton of data out there, but I would say that, you know, as of right now, your health insurance company is not, you know, buying data from Samsung smart bridge. Maybe in the future they could, which is well, you know, a good it, point. it represents a vulnerability. Yeah. It, I wonder it, what the, decrease a premium would be for something like that, right? Well, but that's the part I would add is that's where that's where it always starts, right? No matter what it is, is either do it for convenience or I'll give you a discount for something. Think about your grocery store cards, the shopper cards, so that I can link all of your data together. Um, again, 60% of all the shopper cards, it doesn't matter what store you go to, all go through one system. You're only going through about three data systems for all of that shopper data. But it starts with, oh, it's either going to be convenience or I'm going to give you a discount or on this to get you to consent. And then it becomes the wait. I didn't understand there were implications to getting a discount. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I mean, I think if there's one takeaway that you have from this panel is understand what you're agreeing to, whether in the especially in the insurance context. And I tell people all the time, read your insurance policies. It's going to suck. Okay. You're not going to enjoy this, but you need to read your insurance policies, whether it's individual based policy, whether, especially if it's a commercial policy, if you're a business owner or a risk manager or an employee that deals with those types of things at your company, 
read your policies, understand what they say. And if you have a question, actually proactively ask someone. So we'll actually, speaking of questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Something Matt uh, said made me think. So we're, we, we talk about the amount of data that can be used to make health insurance decisions. And I'm thinking about the move towards, you know, alternative models of healthcare in the United States, like Medicare for all, so, you know, and other countries done that successfully. With as much data as other parts of the insurance industry will get, do you think that the current insurance model is still going to be sustainable when it becomes less a matter, as was said, of, you know, what's happened and now we will adjust your premium as we have enough data to really accurately predict whether your house is going to flood? So the, to me, it seems that the, the, the nature of risk taking and risk underwriting is going to change to something that's got a lot more certainty. Is the insurance model going to still make sense in that world? Thank you. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting because that is like almost a perfect segue into the next question I was going to ask the panel, um, because I wanted to discuss about pooling risk. Right, because that's what insurance does. It pools risk. You get a bunch of people, and ideally, you have some individuals or companies that are very good risk, and then you have some borderline risk. And then you hope that your underwriting does such a good job that even on the poorer risks, you're not paying out too many claims. But the vast majority of your book of business has no claims, so that you're making money and you can use the premium to pay those claims. So, I mean, I, I think that's a, a really good question. And what I would say is, we're already there in a lot of ways. The amount of underwriting that goes into and that's automated for health insurance, for car insurance, for home insurance, for cyber insurance, it, it's, it's kind of there, right? And so generally the status quo hasn't shifted too much. Um, now, the ACA and Obamacare really helped with that, with taking away lifetime you know, maximums, um, you know, and, and other specific statutory requirements that allowed people to get more insurance and like saying, oh, well, you know, you had a pre-existing condition and you switched jobs. Now you can no longer get any coverage for that going forward. Right. So I guess if I was going to answer your question, I would say we still need to make sure that we're keeping insurance companies. Um, we're forcing, not forcing them, but making sure that they're making the right decisions via legislation if needed, via executive order, but also, again, um, you know, understanding that, you know, when we're talking about data aggregation, like we're, we're kind of at a place where, um, and I completely missed my train of thought. So I'll turn it over to the panel to see if you guys have anything else to say. Well, one thing that I would say, if, if you go home, Tomorrow morning, you pick up your box of Cheerios and you look on the side, there is a nutrition label. Imagine you look at the ingredients and it says may contain ingredients. It, it doesn't really tell you anything. You, you can say, well, th this is total disclosure. You want to know what you're agreeing to. Here's a 57 page document that tells you what you're agreeing to that number one, nobody reads. Shame on you. Number two, nobody can understand. Now, you could go out and hire a lawyer, three, four hundred dollars an hour to read this and tell you what it says. Many privacy policies, the lawyer can't tell you. We, we will share data with our business partners. Who are that or who are they? Varies day by day. I can't tell you who my business partners are. I don't know who's going to offer me money tomorrow. I don't know what new sources of data I might want to purchase about you tomorrow. And so the, the point is, what I would love to see is something like nutrition labels for privacy, something that could take a policy and boil it down to say, we are going to take these factors into account, take it or leave it. You, you don't like our policy, go to somebody else, but I, I want something that brings some transparency to it because the 57 page document written in a language that most people don't speak legalese, that doesn't help anybody. And uh, I realize insurance companies are businesses. I, I can't blame them for wanting to make good business decisions, but people need to be able to understand what are you agreeing to? Yeah. And I think it is complicated because it is an insurance contract, right? So there are specific terms and, and each, state has department of insurance 
that like essentially mandates how insurance carriers are to act in that state. So there is unfortunately a, a requirement for the legalese, mm -hmm. but um, you know, and, and it's interesting because as a lawyer and as someone that's worked in the insurance industry, interpreting insurance policies, the amount of ambiguity and potential um, disputes you can have over word choice in an insurance policy is absolutely insane. So I think that's a really good point, but we did have a gentleman um, with a question. Did you want to? Sure. So full disclosure, I work in insurance product development. So I do a lot of what you do, James. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. And, that's, uh, <laughs> good uh, news is I'm more on the technology and the consulting side of it. So I usually tell people they're being stupid. Oh yeah. I, yes. One day I will get to that point. Uh, so I get to do a lot with working with rates, working with data. Mm -hmm. And I also do a lot of policy language and I work with people like you, Rich, all the time too. Um, I'm kind of taking exception to part of what's being discussed here, and I want to see if my observations are valid, if you agree or disagree, because um, I've heard some whispers around the room, and maybe I'm just being too lackadaisical with it. Uh, one of the things that I've observed is, yes, insurance companies collect a lot of data. Matt, to what you were saying before, if, if it's collectible, insurance companies try to collect it, and there is a concern there about being proper stewards of that data. CNA, one of the largest carriers that provided cyber insurance, was hacked. And that's a little disconcerting when you hear that. But so is the state of South Carolina, where you're legally obligated to provide that information. But even with having that information, an insurance company can't just decide, I'm going to start finding out how often they go to the donut shop down the road in a higher risk area, I'm going to charge a more auto premium. They have to get enough data in order to see if that's credible. And that's verified by professional mathematicians, actuaries, and then they actually have to go and get permission to do that and integrate that into the rating per state. And each state, like you were talking about for departments of insurance, regulates differently. So if I go to California, they can use different factors way differently than in Georgia. In fact, California, they can't use half the stuff. They have to use how fast you drive or how often you drive. So with all this information here, I'm worried that we're more worried about the data they're holding, but not necessarily how they're using it because they have to get enough to make a model. Internally, they have to be able to make the model work and then they have to have enough evidence to give it to a state and say, we'd like to use it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that is, seems like a far fetched thing, you know, on a five or 10 year mm -hmm. scale. You think uh, that that's unlikely to happen? Uh, do I think what's unlikely so, that for them to Acquire yeah. that kind of data, build a model, uh, to approach the states. It's it's so, hard. So what is what is? Kinda, I, mean, I assume you're doing like admitted the surplus. Yeah. I do so, both. Okay. Yeah. So for the rest of the room, if you have an admitted insurance policy, that means that the policy language and the rating, how you actually underwrite that policy, is specifically approved by the state Department of Insurance. Which I treat most personal lines like home and auto being admitted. Right. Commercial is a little different. Yeah. And yeah. then you can also have surplus lines, which means it's not admitted in a state. They have a, a kind of a separate license, but the the rating, which is essentially the underwriting protocol algorithm, whatever you want to do it, doesn't have to be approved by the state. So um and I, I think I I really think that's a great comment. And I think that meshes with, with my thoughts on it and kind of where I was going with some of my prior comments in that. It is such a regulata re regulated, regulated industry that it's going to be very, very hard um, for an insurance company to say, "Hey, um, we're going to add into our rating, our, our rater, uh, data we bought from a data broker that you know this insured did not provide consent for us to aggregate." Right? I think that's going to be a, a difficult ask, and I don't think a DOI is really going to approve that. Can I actually comment on that? <laughs> sure. A lot of states it is approved um, because what they do is they actually buy from centralized aggregators. Um, so it's not necessarily even data they have to have permission to get because it's commercially available. Now, here's here's but do you I, have do you have like a specific example, though, because like I can tell you in all the lines of insurance that I've handled and so, worked with DOIs and getting things admitted, that's not been I, my experience. I got my question. I, I'm but, just going to sure. But here's, thanks, man. Here's the other part of what I'm going to say is this is right now, um, because, again, when I, I've dealt with a lot of the DOIs and I've dealt with international insurance, too. So I deal personal commercial lines. I've done a bunch of weird lines, other stuff like this. 
in general, rating engines and rating calculations are already complex enough. And they're looking to aggregate and spread the risk overall. We can talk a lot about how would I look to use this data to make it make sense. But honestly, as long as I'm in a position of having to figure that out and calculate it out, I'm spreading a risk enough that I don't necessarily care enough to get down in that level of detail because most of the kind of data that gets pulled into rating algorithms is if it's very specific stuff, it's, you know, your driving records. Um, you can pull certain kinds of health and medical records. There, there's things there that they're getting to get enough of a picture of which bucket do you fit in? Right now, we're not in a world where insurers really want to get down to the 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 nth level of who you are because it's all about risk management, risk mitigation, and risk spread. That being said, what I'm looking at down the road in probably 10 to 15 years when the technology evolves, and this is one of those things where when everybody is going and saying, oh, well, let's just go to nationalized healthcare. Um, I've done projects in countries with nationalized healthcare and looking at the data that they have that they want and how they want to use it. I would say that there's a much greater degree of risk with centralized healthcare not having any competition and government control over it, where there would be a much greater incentive because you're not necessarily paying premiums directly, it's coming straight out of tax dollars, where the incentive is on the government to find ways to cut costs. We see this every day with Medicare and Medicaid. If you look at the Canadian healthcare system, you if you want certain kinds of coverage, day to day, I got a cold, great, it works fine. If you have some significant medical issues, you better have a private policy on top of it. This is one of those places where I would argue that competition makes it much healthier about what level of data they're looking for because you're anonymized because there's not, you don't have every single human being in one single pool to look at that data collectively. So I would actually argue this is one of those places where the competition actually anonymizes you and your data much more. And I'm saying this is today. However, looking at some of the things that have been proposed and some of the things that from a technologies aspect that have been asked for, I can tell you the kinds of things that are being proposed to some of these state agencies in preparation for where do we need to build systems to be in 10 years in anticipate, anticipation of being able to pull in and use that data in five or 10 or 15 or 20 years. It's like when I worked on some of the AI self-driving car stuff back in the late nineties, that was an anticipation of where we are today. So now we see these companies asking these questions and starting to look at this for 10, 15, 20 years down the road. And AI has meant that accelerated to things they might be have been looking to ask for in 15 years, they're asking for in five. If I could just make a quick comment, this is, I have uh, up on my iPad, an article from CBS News from last September. Consumer group says MasterCard is selling cardholder data without their knowledge and insurance companies are one of the prime customers buying mm -hmm. it. Now, this article does not say a word about what insurance companies are doing with it. There's some speculation, but nobody from the insurance industry wanted to explain what they're doing, but they are buying the data. That's, that's out there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it may well be that it's going to be down the road that it, it gets worked into the algorithms. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, th this is a year old article that, uh, in fact, they, they said that MasterCard has its own division for selling credit card transactions. So you might think when you go to the store and buy whatever you buy at the store that that's between you and the store, but that information is available. It's commercial information now because MasterCard is willing to sell that to whoever wants to know. Yeah, but I, I just want to comment before it gets to the question. From the insurance carrier perspective though, you can't, <laughs> you have to underwrite each risk individually. Like, yes, you can look at a, a broader scope of individuals, but um, if I'm applying for health insurance, they're not going to look at my neighbors to say whether or not I should get health insurance, right? Like it, it's a specific risk to the person that is a part of that contract. Cause this isn't, again, I'm, I'm belaboring this point here. It is a contractual relationship. 
So if there's entities or individuals outside of that relationship, that's not really something that you can use in the underwriting process most of the time. Now, there might be some exceptions such as, you know, flood zoning and things like that, or, you know, you live in LA and there's earthquakes. But I want you guys to think about when, when you're thinking about the data risk and aggregation risk, it, it, if you're in a pool of people, that's going to be good for overall trend lines and okay, what percent, you know, what's the, the, the proration or how are we going to adjust the rater for this specific risk based upon like systemic exposure to like an entire population? It's not necessarily going to impact like you individually, but. I have been retired now for six years. Congratulations. Thank you. And I noticed that my auto insurance has been going up and up. Mm -hmm. Is there anything I could do to mitigate that? Because one of the, th the things that I've been considering is getting rid of the car altogether and just go with Lyft or an Uber and then rent a car for when I go out of town because it's, it's, getting, it's getting ridiculous. So something that um, we see a lot in, in all lines of insurance is um, the longer you're with a company, the more money they'll try to get from you, okay? Mm -hmm. And so um, I encourage, even though I work for an insurance company, I encourage all my policyholders shop around, right? Like, and it might be a little, you know, might have some issues. You might have some data issues where you got to input some things and, and whatnot, but um, generally there's a lot of market participants who, you know, will offer you a deal as a new customer. And it, that might mean you shop around every couple of years or something similar. But um, one of the benefits to data aggregation and kind of data flow is that there are some um, different entrants to the marketplace that make underwriting easier. And that's where they save costs and then can reduce your premium because they're not doing a handwritten underwriting process. They're not doing interviews They're You know, there's not this huge. Uh, apparatus of individuals underwriting like auto loss. It's all automated. So I, I just, just a supplement. I live here in Atlanta and when I was working, I was commuting 80 miles a day. And now I just run around the corner and pick up my grandkids. Right. So the only, the other thing is here in Atlanta, driving the speed limit is not the thing. <laughs> so thank you. No problem. Nine over or you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. So rating algorithms. How are those rating algorithms audited, especially as we approach the age of black box AI integrations where nobody really has enough information to describe why the AI did the thing it chose to do? So um, from an admitted perspective, if you are, have an admitted insurance policy, the state's Department of Insurance is um, auditing those, those raters. So they're specifically looking at how do you underwrite what the costs are, what are the, the, the things that, and unfortunately I forget the term of art for it, but essentially there are things that can modify modifiers, modify your premium. Yeah. Okay. And so for admitted policies, all of those modifiers and the, the cost modification, like the actual, uh, percentage or whatever has to be publicly disclosed to the DOI. Okay. And so they review that they make sure it's reasonable and within their guidelines. And then the policy gets admitted. All right. So if, if you have a concern in regards to that type of issue, then you'll want to look towards admitted policies where there is an actual audit process. But um, I can tell you a lot of insurance carriers are using AI um, and or other machine, machine learning, learning, right, to, to better underwrite risk or to more easily underwrite risk. But in my experience, a lot of it has been just to streamline manual processes versus making actual decisions. The, yeah, the rating algorithms that I have dealt with, and I'm, I'm actively involved in building them for clients currently, um, are still very hard algorithms. And the data sources and all of that are certified through the DOIs, they're audited by the major houses. So AI, AI's involvement now is much more along the lines of to your point, processes and whatnot, analytics of it on the back end, but the actual rating of it itself is very straightforward. That being said, I'm I'm working with a couple of vendor company clients we're looking at doing integrations with, and we're doing some pilots with a number of companies that are experimenting with AI-driven 
rating algorithms. They're not certified yet by the DOIs. They're not built out yet by the DOIs, but these there's several companies, and I'm, I'm doing some, some stuff with them, where they're looking at being able to use AIs to make much more nuanced judgments. This is part of what I was kind of alluding to earlier that I probably shouldn't be talking about. Um, but uh, looking at some of those things that some of these companies are working towards, mm -hmm. but right now today, again, this is not, a, you know, the rating algorithms are very fixed, very, you know, very firm. If you're looking at the modifiers for something that adjusts a rate up or down, you know, again, a lot of that does come from aggregators, be it state databases, be it company databases, things like that, that have information about you that pull it in. But honestly, it's not hard data to get. So. I, but I think a question is, is about transparency and accountability is, is what access does the person trying to get insurance have to audit that algorithm to figure out where all that data came from? And, and if so, even to, to contest it, to appeal based on where that data comes from. What percentage of people in this room read your EULAs, much less your insurance contracts? <laughs> and this is going to be a very high sample size based on this particular track. Right. Yeah, I mean, and I think that's a good question. But I mean, ultimately, though, insurance is is a service and a product that um, is capitalistic, right? So if if you don't like what it is, don't go with that insurance company. There isn't, I mean, outside of like the healthcare context, yeah, there's not a lot of, I mean, there's like a broker lobby, right? Like there's some very powerful insurance brokers, Marsh, Aon, Willis Towers, Watson, especially in the commercial space where they will be like, hey, uh, you guys need to stop charging so much. And so you can leverage like an insurance broker relationship if you really have those kind of questions and, and maybe they can, you know, help you out. Uh, I just had a question about kind of curiosity of what data insurance companies are using today versus what they would like to use in the future versus what they legally are not allowed to use. Um, and this is really from like the point of view of most consumers have homeowners insurance and car insurance. So I just kind of wrote down thoughts in my head. Um, you know, uh, drone footage, delivery drones that are like doing deliveries now. They like snapping photos of houses as they fly over, that kind of stuff. Um, toll lanes and fast lanes that are tracking like your car movement as it goes down the highway, flock cameras, automated license plate readers, that kind of stuff. Just what of that do insurance companies already have access to because it's being sold to data brokers versus what would they like to use if they could get that data versus they're not allowed to use. And then lastly, um, Second question I had was uh, if any of you could touch on just your point of view from the insurance standpoint on the CrowdStrike incident that happened a couple months ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh -huh. So um, I can definitely take the CrowdStrike one, but we can wait a little bit. But um, from my perspective, you know, car and auto, home and auto and things like that, for, for anything that uh, a car insurance carrier is collecting, they need to get consent. Okay, outside of like your driving record, right? But I think you might even have to consent to that as well, right? So really they need to consent. Like I just got new car insurance because I was shopping around because my last one was way too expensive. And they sent me one of those ODB plugs. Like, hey, we'll give you a 10% discount. I just like sent it back to them. All right. And they're just like, all right, you don't get your discount. I'm like, all right, well, you're not going to know how fast I drive because it's fast. <laughs> <laughs> right? So to, to a certain extent, we're still at a place where you need to have consent to get that information. Um, in the drone context, we are seeing that in usually claim evaluation. Um, I've not heard or seen of it in an underwriting evaluation. Satellite footage. Satellite to at, footage. To look at your roofs. Yep, to that's To look at true. your tree coverage. Right. Do you have a pool you didn't declare? Did you put in something like that? Have you... That's a good point. Uh, there's a lot of things, especially with homeowners insurance that satellite footage is used much more often. And then if they need more detail, they'll send out somebody with a drone. Um, now for claims assessment though, I'm seeing a lot more usage of drones, drone footage, because right. that means the guy doesn't have to get up there and look at your roof for the hail damage. He flies a drone over the top, grabs a couple of pictures, makes a decision. Um, I've seen drones being used to capture post accident footage. Um, there has been talk about usage of that by police departments to grab that footage and that would then be able to be shared with the insurers to help adjudicate the wrecks. Um, 
a lot of that sort of stuff. Now we can talk about how drones have created new risks in the insurance market. Well, so we have, do you have yeah, I, because insurance is regulated at the state level, some of these answers are going to vary state by state. Again, I'm, I'm going to CBS News from exactly one month ago today, July 31st. Headline, California woman's home insurance dropped after drone reveals clutter unsanitary conditions during renovation. She had the same insurance company for homeowners insurance for 40 years. They dropped her and when she called them, they said that a drone picked up a lot of clutter in your backyard because she was going through a renovation. Uh, she got a hold of CBS News, CBS got a hold of the insurance company and the insurance company said, we don't use drones. Well, they told the woman that they did, um, but they said, we don't use drones, but we do use third party data sources. So uh, anyway, all I'm saying is the, the answer is gonna vary state by state in terms of uh, usage of what, uh, how drones and things like that are being used. But if you, if you ask me, would I be surprised if Amazon was, you know, as they start flying more drones to deliver to your doorstep that they're selling that data? No. <laughs> Uh, first off, oh yeah. So you know what? It so unfortunately the CrowdStrike portion is not particularly on point for our panel today. And I wanted to get to these three questions, but if anybody would like to discuss CrowdStrike, um, I'm very active in handling those matters, so I'm happy to do so. Just I, I want to get through these questions because we only have about seven minutes left. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, sorry, I wrote this down stream of consciousness, so hopefully I I make sense here. So. The point I was uh, getting, I believe, from uh, Mr. Gatz was, don't worry, your insurance company is heavily regulated by the uh, government, so you're fine. The uh, government's here to help you. So so your information okay. is safe because there's too much, and also your information is safe because it's too much work to analyze and get consent from uh, Mr. Nettles, right? It's too hard to get to build the algorithm, so there's no financial incentive to Today. look at this data. Today. Today. When the AI gets smart enough to do it, then we'll have them do it automatically. Um, doesn't uh, Florida and the housing insurance debacle, which, which we just hinted at uh, just a minute ago, uh, and their junk insurance companies that they have all over the state now, doesn't that hint that the companies and the politicians that they have in their pockets hint otherwise drones being allowed to make snap judgments? Isn't that kind of like your doctor doing a, a Zoom check and making a diagnosis over the, uh, over the internet? We're, we're back to the notion of insurance is a spread of average risk. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to aggregate that as much as possible. But again, it's spreading the risk. The big thing that we're seeing with the changes that I've been kind of alluding to is technology means that we've got a lot more capability to include a lot more in this decision making process. It is up to the individual state DOIs to determine is that valid data to help make those decisions about spreading the risk. Um, because I, again, today, the level of minutia anybody wants to get into about how you spread that risk really kicks in around things like discounts, modifiers, right? It's the, oh, you wanna get this discount? Well, you need to feed us this data, whether it's the plug in the chip or you plug in the smart home so I know what your power usage looks like. And you know, it's today, again, much of the minutia and the things that get calculated into rating are much more along the lines of, if you give me this, I will cut you a discount. Right. And, and I would just add to, to your point in regards to my statement, um, whereas your statement was accurate, I, I do want to clarify that. Um, yeah, it was, it was stream of consciousness. No, I know. Trust, but verify, right? I think that <laughs> what I meant by like being regulated by state DOIs is that there is somewhat a fail safe. All right. And yes, you do have uh, junk insurance companies, which is, again, why you want to go with an admitted insurance company, because if that company fails, Typically, the state DOI has funds to make good on some of those claims, okay? And in the kind of homeowner context, we're seeing a lot of um, changes due to climate change. And so what that means is you have actuarial data going back probably 100 plus years now on weather patterns. It's all useless, right? So again, you're not appropriately being able to evaluate risk, which is leading to companies going out of business. And then also very, very strict 
um, like, oh, we're leaving California, or we're leaving Florida type of decisions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next question, please. Hi, I have an interesting perspective of being here in that I worked 15 years in the insurance industry, um, working in software development for the Raiders. Um, I have now switched it to being a home inspector and I commercially fly drones. So I was hoping cool. I'd feel more, I'd hear more about the drones, but that's okay. Um, but really my question is, it, there's, a, there's a lot of buzz in the home inspection industry uh, right now with, uh, we have to uh, use software to write our reports. And one of the big software companies just got sold out to another company that has been known for selling data. So my question being, have you heard anything about uh, any kind of inspection data that's being pulled in anywhere? I know that, again, I do understand the perspective that it's, it's broad spread, but just because this is rumor, I was hoping to get it. And if you hear, heard of anything, you're, I haven't heard anything. You're probably much closer to, to that yes, given no. your expertise and background, but I, I wouldn't surprise me. Okay. And oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, I was just gonna say, if it's what I suspect, yes, there, there are a number of mergers going on. The other thing you don't see as much of is that there are a lot of companies like, you know, one that would be very similar to HAL, H-A-L, you know, you know where that comes from. Um, IBM. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, IBM, Deloitte, a number of these companies are also creating adjunct services, which is kind of the backdoor way where they are pulling in a lot of this data and then creating systems and solutions by which this data can be made available to insurers, or sorry, insurers, and be separated by a couple of steps in terms of the data, how it gets presented and what level of aggregation. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I think in general, one of the big problems that is kind of universal to all of this is just how patently unregulated uh, the the data sales landscape is. I mean, we have no federal consumer privacy regulations at all in the United States. So if you give your, you know, the whole problem we were talking about is like, uh oh, what is the insurance industry buying? And then how are they going to use it? But really, I mean, there are no regulations preventing them from buying any of this stuff anyway, uh, regardless of how they're eventually or not going to use it. So, I mean, I think one of the big things we're touching on here is, in my opinion, the insurance industry is underregulated, but also even maybe more immediate a need than that is for federal consumer privacy regulation. Yes. Yeah. And I, I would throw in one other thing on top of that. Th there's a, a term that many of you may be familiar with called regulatory capture. It is frequently used in context of pharmaceutical industry, also used in context of the agricultural industry. I am not saying that this has happened with the insurance industry. That's not my expertise. But regulatory capture is where due to dollars, due to people moving from government to the private sector and from private sector to government, agency, excuse me, businesses that are supposed to be regulated end up capturing the regulatory agency. Look at executives from Big Pharma, look at who runs the FDA, and then look at where they used to work five, 10 years ago. It's a revolving door. That's called regulatory capture. The, the regulated become the regulators. And like I said, I am not saying that this is going on in, in, in uh, insurance. I don't know. But um, this is one of my big concerns when it comes to privacy legislation. We do need privacy legislation. I don't want Google and Facebook writing it. I know we're running short on time, so I'll zip through my stuff quick. Um, my full disclosure is I've traveled the U.S. for 25 years doing all the manner of safety assessment work on the commercial line side for plenty of big insurance companies, including CMA, CNA. Don't get me started on them. <laughs> um, Former employee, so. Okay. We'll chat later. <laughs> um, one of my big pet peeves is, yo, know, I think it was Rich that said, read your damn policies in what, two or three of us raised our hands mm -hmm. about the EULA question. I have the background. I can do a keyword search and determine if a contract or a EULA, say, has a hold harmless clause in it. Um, and then you said, you mentioned, I think it was James, used the phrase implications of discounts. Um, I would say Americans in general are lazy about this kind of thing. So I don't think simply making the wording of these things easier or more simple is sufficient. What you, what would y'all suggest to a 
move us in the right direction, getting more people uh, reading these things. Um, people are lazy. That's just, <laughs> um, unless there's an incentive or a real benefit that people are willing to do that versus the, I mean, we're now programmed to check a box and accept binding contracts every day. Just the number of things that you'll click the box on your phone and accept thinking it has no implications. So how do we get people to, I mean, I, if you can come up with that answer, I can tell you exactly how we can capitalize it. Great shirt. Thank you. So we, we've talked a lot about data that is true and accurate and how that can be used in insurance. But one of the things that I encountered when I was shopping for a home insurance policy most recently is they had a lot of information about my home that just wasn't true. How, as we start aggregating more data that doesn't have necessarily mechanisms for challenging it, you know, it doesn't have the credit reports, you know, legal protection. If there's drone footage, you know, maybe you can contest it, maybe you can't. What do you think of the risk that it poses that you might get extra, you know, spurious data in this mix that then the consumers are beholden to? That's, I think it's a great question. Um, I think from an underwriting perspective, if you get a, a negative underwriting decision, you can contest that. And there, you know, every single insurance company has a process by which you can do that. And if you don't like it, you can then file a complaint with that state's DOI, the state where you're domiciled, saying, hey, they weren't, you know, they didn't comply with their underwriting process or they used wrong information. So it, while it's not as robust as like, you know, filing a fair credit report, you know, complaint or something like that, there is a, a process for it. Um, but I, I do think that's a huge risk. And obviously, the more data you collect, the more likely there is to be bad data in it. Um, so I, I, I think it's going to be one of the key problems that insurance companies are going to have to resolve going forward. Yeah. And uh, to me, that goes back to the data privacy laws and the ability to get things corrected, because in, in this country, it is extraordinarily difficult to get thing, bad data corrected, right? Because data aggregators are just scooping stuff up. But the, the, what, the other side of this becomes the generally, and again, I'm speaking very much in general terms because there's always exceptions to the rule, but generally, this goes back to the reason why you pull data, you, you, know, you smooth data out and you smooth the risks out because the simpler you can make it, the less of those kinds of problems you get into. Thank you. 